The events in this program are inspired by a true story. Names, dates, and details have been changed. Viewer discretion is advised. On this episode of Bizarre Murders. When a young woman suddenly falls into a coma, doctors at first are mystified. But when they find a rare and life-threatening toxin in her system, they get suspicious. And when detectives discover evidence of an enemy close to home, they realize they're not looking for some common criminal, but someone far more terrifying. should die that way. I've never seen anything that horrific. One of the duties of a pathologist is to determine the cause of death. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Download Beely now. Three days ago, Jennifer admitted herself to the hospital. I've just been having a a lot of trouble breathing. Within a day, she'd fallen into a coma. Jennifer's nervous system is shutting down, and the doctors don't know why. It'll be okay, baby. Jennifer's live-in boyfriend, Tyler, never leaves her side. As Jennifer's body shuts down, doctors make an unexpected discovery. She's ingested a toxin that occurs naturally in a highly poisonous plant called hemlock. You might have heard of hemlock. It's a pretty plant, but you don't want it in a bouquet. It's seriously toxic. The Greek philosopher Socrates famously committed suicide by drinking a potion made from the stuff. And boy, is it an awful way to go. Paralysis sets in, and you can feel yourself suffocating, but you can't do anything about it. It's brutal. And it gets worse. There's no antidote to hemlock poisoning. Even a small dose, less than a tenth of a gram, can be fatal. Jennifer's ingested twice that. It's only a matter of time before Jennifer stops being able to breathe altogether. Considering the huge dose of hemlock in Jennifer's system, you don't have to be Sherlock Holmes to figure out that she's consumed something that was deliberately laced with the hemlock toxin. As a cop, that ain't something you see every day. Lead Detective Findlay learns that Jennifer was at home the day before she went to the hospital. Since the effects of hemlock toxin usually take 24 hours to kick in, she most likely ate or drank something laced with the poison at her apartment. There's an old movie called DOA that begins with a man reporting a murder. The cops ask him who got killed. I did, he says. He just found out someone had fatally poisoned him. And that's what we have here. But in this case, Jennifer can't give us any clues as to who might have done this to her or why. She's what we call a silent witness. Lab results reveal that a bottle of milk found in the fridge contains the residue of hemlock powder. For Detective Findlay, this is now a case of attempted murder. Getting the hemlock into a sealed bottle without making it look tampered with is harder than it looks. It's like not leaving tracks in the mud. It's pretty tricky. But whoever did this knew what they were doing. 
six days after admitting herself to hospital, Jennifer dies. It's no longer attempted murder. It's now a homicide investigation. Whoever poisoned that milk must have known someone was in for a slow and painful death. But who done it and why done it are anyone's guess. A deadly prank at the bottling plant? Nah, it's not likely. Quality control would have caught that. A demented milkman? Maybe. But the first person we always talk to is the last person to have seen the victim. Tell me about you and Jenny. Were you having any issues? No, things were great. Really great, man. OK, maybe we were arguing some about money. Jenny was paying the rent. But it didn't matter. We loved each other. Hey, babe. What are you doing? Babe, oh my God. babe, will you make me the happiest man alive? Yes, 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 yes! <laughs> so according to Tyler, things were pretty hunky-dory between him and Jennifer. But think about it. Jennifer was poisoned when she drank milk from her own fridge. And milk has a shelf life, so the poisoning had to be timed properly. Tyler lived with her. He knew when the milk got delivered. In the murder game, that's what we call opportunity. And Tyler himself didn't get sick, which suggests he knew not to touch that milk. Look familiar? The hemlock the doctors told you about? It was found in the milk in your fridge. Jeez, well, how did it get in there? Surprising your suspect, maybe with a photograph or some information. It's an old trick, and it's a good one. As every poker player knows, we all have a tell. It's not proof of anything, but it can scare the hell out of a guilty suspect. And that's a good thing. Things aren't looking good for Tyler. But if he did poison Jennifer, Detective Findlay needs some hard evidence to connect him to the crime. Without that, she's forced to let him go, for now. Jennifer's apartment is now a crime scene. While looking for evidence that could tie Tyler directly to the poisoning, investigators find something unusual. Looks like someone's been sending death threats to these two harmless kids from the sticks, telling them it's either time to move out or get rubbed out. And now Jenny's dead. It's hard to know if it's all some practical joke gone seriously wrong, or if it's something downright evil. Could these letters hold the key to tracking down a killer? Recognize any of these? Yeah, those things. We got one every month for a year. Why didn't you mention the letters before now? I don't know, we just figured it was some sort of prank, like some big city thing. We collected them for fun, but we didn't get one this month, so we threw them in the trash. And I guess I forgot about them. Did Jennifer have any enemies? Old boyfriends that stalked her? No, I'm the only guy she's ever dated. The forensics lab finds something significant, trace amounts of hemlock and microscopic amounts of other toxins, all derived from plants, deadly nightshade, snake root, wolfsbane. The letters cast doubt on Tyler as a suspect. Sure, he had the opportunity, but whoever poisoned the milk and wrote those letters is someone with an education in botany. And Tyler isn't exactly the academic type. Then there's lack of motive. He just popped a question. And investigators also learned that they have no life insurance. After jealousy, that's the most common motive for murder among couples. As a suspect, Tyler's starting to take a back seat. 
the letters are addressed to Jennifer and Tyler. So whoever wrote them knew who they were. And they'd been hand-delivered, not mailed. That means it was someone who had access to the apartment building. Detective Findlay thinks the letter writer could be another tenant. Any issues with the neighbors? Noise complaints, that kind of thing? No, never. We said hi to people in the building, but mostly just kept to ourselves. It's an oldie but a goodie, perps returning to the scene of the crime. But what if they never left? If Jennifer's killer is a neighbor, chances are that person is right under Finley's nose. In other words, it's time to start knocking on doors. There are over a hundred tenants in the building. Yes, I'm Detective Finley. I'm investigating an issue with contaminated milk in the building. To avoid causing a panic, Findlay says she's investigating contaminated milk deliveries, not murder. And she casually drops the word hemlock while she questions the tenants. Have you ever heard of the plant hemlock? Yeah, it's legal in California, I think, right? Detectives have canvassed the entire building, but so far haven't come up with any new leads. No one else has fallen sick, and most people in the building have never even heard of a poison plant called hemlock. But when Detective Findlay reviews her notes, she remembers something a tenant said to her that didn't seem significant at the time. Hello. Hello? I'm investigating an issue with contaminated milk in the building. OK. Uh, have you ever heard of the plant hemlock? Uh, no, I have not heard of hemlock, but contaminated milk, that's no joke, detective. Is there anything else I can do for you? No. Thank you. You're most welcome. The phrase, no joke, rings a bell with Detective Findlay. As it happens, the tenant's apartment is next door to Tyler and Jennifer's. His name is Charles, and he's lived in the building for 15 years. Sure, it could be a coincidence that the guy right next door used the same words as the death threat. But if it isn't some fluke, talk about fearing thy neighbor. Detective Findlay runs a background check on Charles. It turns out, Charles has a criminal record. Looks like back in college days, Charles liked to earn while he learned. He got tossed out for growing marijuana plants in his dorm room and did a stint in the big house for it. His major? An advanced degree in botany. So chances are pretty doggone good that he knows what hemlock is. This Charles fella is looking like a mighty good suspect, if you ask me. After prison, Charles reinvented himself as a rare book dealer. who also invented a role-playing game called Solution. Yes, yes, yes. Where players have to solve murder mystery scenarios that Charles writes. Scenario 21, the Beethoven Solution. Bum, 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 bum. A botany background, a criminal record, the no joke phrase, not to mention that he lives right next door. It's all pretty fishy. The thing is, investigators don't have any evidence at all tying him to Jennifer's murder. If he is their guy, what they need is for Charles to incriminate himself. And that means staking him out. Detective Findlay's plan is simple. Posing as someone who's inherited a rare book collection. She'll befriend Charles and hopefully get him to trust her. If this Charles character is the killer, Findlay hopes he'll let something slip and she can nail him for Jennifer's murder. But right now, he's just a long shot suspect. Is the detective on a wild goose chase? Or is she stepping into the lion's den? Hi. 
Hi, I'm Phoebe. I emailed you about this book. Yes. It's a pleasure to meet you, Phoebe. Do you know what you have here? This is a treasure. My father had an awful lot of books. Well, I'm impressed. It would be a great pleasure to see the rest of your collection. Now that Detective Findlay's made initial contact with Charles, she can play out her undercover role and hopefully observe him up close. Cheers. Getting your foot in the door is certainly the toughest part of going undercover. If they don't trust you in the beginning, they never will. And if you do get in, believe me, you're usually not hanging out with a brain trust right away. But Charles is a different kind of target. He's smart, he's cultured. It's hard to put the whammy on a guy like Charles, and that could make things tricky for Detective Findlay. <clears throat> What's that? Well, I present to you solution. It doesn't take long for Detective Findlay to insert herself into Charles's life. <laughs> a natural 20 on your first time. She even starts playing Charles's game Solution with him, all the while keeping her ears and eyes alert for anything suspicious. You know, it's so hard to find good company, Phoebe. I can't relate to Riff Raff, and I don't want to. I'm, I'm not afraid to admit it. I, I feel like I am, well, some people are just beneath us. Mm. I mean, wouldn't you agree that the world would just be better off without some people, without most people, really? Yes. Not you and I. Come on. <laughs> Charles ain't exactly a team player, is he? Turns out his brains have, well, gone to his head over the years. He's a total snob and proud of it, too. But having a superiority complex does not make you a murderer. And Finley has no idea if he even had Jennifer and Tyler on his radar. After all, people like them are, in his own words, just riffraff. People are just such ignorant apes. But to Finley, there's something hinky about Chuck. She can't put her finger on it, but that old detective's sixth sense starts working overtime. Weeks go by, but not once does Charles mention anything about Jennifer. Detective Findlay starts to wonder if she's been investigating the wrong person all this time. And the brass is giving her the gears. If Findlay doesn't come up with something concrete tying Charles to Jennifer's murder, her undercover operation will be shut down. You are obviously a very intelligent woman, Phoebe, but, well, let's see if you're smart enough to figure out this one. Let's. I call this the Socrates Connection inspired by a true story from ancient Greece. Mm -hmm. A man is found dead with a hemlock potion beside the body. Oh. Is it suicide or murder? Charles, how clever. If Charles's past as a failed botanist made Findlay suspicious, this clinches it. Charles knows what hemlock is and what it can do. It can't be a coincidence. Detective Findlay now has to wonder if her cover is blown. This is what you call a catch-22. If Chuck is on to Detective Findlay, there's no way he'll incriminate himself now. But if she drops the undercover act, she won't have any evidence to connect him to Jennifer. And that Socrates reference could be one of those hints I like to call a not-so-veiled threat. Keep your powder dry, detective. Charles has lied about knowing what hemlock is, but Detective Findlay has no motive and no evidence that either links him to Jennifer's murder or rules him out. Is it suicide or murder? With the plug about to be pulled on her undercover operation, Detective Findlay decides to try a different tactic. Hi, Tyler. Tomorrow night, 9 p.m. And remember, make it loud. This is remarkable. 
Your father must have really cared about his collection. Are your neighbors always so loud? I haven't heard them before. Those bumpkins? Not lately, no. I went next door and asked them to turn it down, told them they were being rude, and well, they, uh, they desisted. But I suppose they couldn't live without their crude rock music for long. Getting Tyler to blast that music was some nice sleight of hand, detective. Looks like Charles just slipped up. Remember, Tyler told investigators that no one had ever complained about their music, but Charles said he had complained. I guess he needed to explain why Findlay had never heard loud music before. Now she knows that Charles was aware of Jennifer and Tyler, even if they weren't aware of him. They're such ignoramuses. And he obviously doesn't like them. Not one bit. Are you going someplace, Charles? Oh. Yes, I'm off to Italy. There's a book fair there. And besides, I... I need to get away from that. From them. If they would just leave me be and disappear so I could live my life in peace. That's all I ask. <sighs> but I digress. Would you be so kind as to water my plants while I'm away? Of course. Uh, anything. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's the perfect opportunity. When Charles is out of town, Detective Findlay can sweep his apartment for possible evidence. No pun intended, but that's one spine-chilling book collection. It may not be proof positive that Charles is a killer, but it doesn't have to be. For Detective Finley, it's just one coincidence too many. When Detective Findlay searches Charles's storage locker, she finds dozens of toxic botanicals, including a huge stash of hemlock plants. Charles lied about not knowing what hemlock is. He lied about complaining to Tyler and Jennifer about the noise. His remark about contaminated milk being no joke, the Socrates game scenario that involved hemlock, his obvious contempt for Tyler and Jennifer, and now some bedtime reading that's guaranteed to put you to sleep permanently. Investigators now have hard evidence that connects Charles to the poison that killed Jennifer. But what they don't have is means and motive. Charles's journals reveal that Jennifer and Tyler had unknowingly annoyed and offended him ever since they'd moved in. Imbecile. I can't live like this. He spied on his new neighbors, listening to them through the wall. At first, he complains to himself about their music, their working class jobs, their hayseed accents. As Charles grows more enraged and obsessed with Jennifer and Tyler, a plan forms in his mind. Charles thinks Jennifer and Tyler are way beneath him. The problem is, they're right next door. In Charlie's unhinged mind, the neighbors have to go one way or another. Now, normally you'd just bang on the wall and tell him to shut up, but Charles ain't the confrontational type, and shut up probably isn't in his vocabulary. He has his own way of doing things. The journals reveal just how Charles got the hemlock into the milk. He even boasts of the plan's simplicity. Who would suspect an innocent bottle of milk 
could be fatal. The dates in the journals also explain why Tyler didn't get sick. The day Charles poisoned the milk, Tyler was playing a gig. What are you, what are you doing here? Remember me? Charles is charged with premeditated murder. His lawyer tries to paint his client as a quiet, cultured man with an eccentric interest in dangerous botanicals. Imbeciles. Charles gets life without parole. Some people are smarter than others, that's a fact. And some people think they're smarter than others. Then there are people who think they're smarter than the police. And that is a big mistake, but it's a common mistake. What's not so common is murdering somebody with a rare toxin like hemlock and thinking you'll get away with it. Here's some advice for the Charlies of the world. If you're going to spike someone, don't use something that only you would know about, because that kind of narrows things down. Better yet, don't poison anyone at all. And if your neighbors are getting on your nerves, call the super. The events in this program are inspired by a true story. Names, dates, and details have been changed. Viewer discretion is advised. On this episode of Bizarre Murders. Thanks, Daddy. Spoiled rich girl Paige manipulates her parents to do all her bidding. But when tragedy strikes, ah! Paige's thirst for revenge That's enough! will have her throwing a temper tantrum. Please, open up! With deadly consequences. A high school senior, Paige is a straight-A student and head of the Daughter of the Lone Star State Cotillion Committee. Something doesn't seem right. The annual family portrait is something that wealthy socialite Giselle insists on, <sighs> no matter how old her daughter Paige gets. Oh, I can always count on you, Mommy. I love it. It's perfect. Okay, ladies. Let's get this family portrait done. Okay, Daddy. Giselle had trouble getting pregnant and considers her daughter a miracle. Paige, in turn, adores her mother. Hi, sweetie. <laughs> I told you that I needed the latest version of my phone, and you ignored me. Nothing's good enough for her. Giselle and her airline executive husband, Edward, are doting parents. Doting, huh? Well, that's not so secret code for parents who spoil their kids. Love them, fine. But indulge their every whim, never say no, and give them a credit card? Well, don't be surprised if they turn into entitled little monsters. We're sorry, honey. Thanks, Daddy. Forgiven. Every winter, Edward takes his two favorite ladies on a lavish holiday to an exotic locale. But this year's dream vacation to Rio de Janeiro turns into a nightmare. While enjoying a goji berry body wrap, Giselle died from what doctors believe was a sudden stroke. Don't touch her. 
Paige's entire world has been shaken to the core. She's about to turn 18, graduate high school, and move into the adulting phase of her life. Losing her mom is coming at a very pivotal time. How that plays out is the question. Some teenagers shut down while others act out. A lot of that is gonna depend on Edward. Handing over the credit card may not be enough. A few months after Giselle's death, Edward swipes right on lovecombustion.com and starts dating. Back in my day, combustion created smoke, not love. At least most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. I'm having such a good time with you. I know what you're thinking. It's fast. Am I right? Well, there's an old saying when it comes to losing a spouse, women mourn, men replace. Don't, don't blame me. I didn't make it up. I'm not saying that Edward is over losing Giselle. Just saying guys deal better with stuff, not feelings. But tell that to his daughter. Upset that her father has moved on from her mother's death so quickly, Paige does what she does best when she's angry. She gets even. Paige starts stealing from her father, staying out all night, and hanging out with a bad crowd. Have you been, Paige? <laughs> what do you care? Isn't Claire expecting you for brunch? She has nothing to do with this. <laughs> yeah, you're right. She doesn't. She's not the one who got married and forgot about it. Do not talk to me that way, young lady. You don't even seem sad that mommy's gone. What, was this your plan the whole time? So that you could live out some sick and twisted fantasy of being some swinging bachelor? You are out of line and that's enough! <laughs> Leave me alone! Ouch. Paige is taking her emotions out on Edward in more ways than one. The spoiled little girl has grown up. She used to throw tantrums to get her way. Now she throws kicks. Entitlement and anger management issues are a doozy of a combination. Paige finds comfort in the arms of Trey, her new boyfriend. They spend hours texting one another. Okay, Daddy, Trey's on his way over, and I can't wait for you to meet him, so be on your best behavior for me, okay? Hey. Yo, what's up? You're a bad influence on my daughter. That's what's up. What? She's a grown woman. Listen, you little shit. Well, hey, man, cool it, all right? <laughs> Mommy never treated my boyfriends like this. thinking about you. Baby, don't think about you all day. You deserve something <gasps> real nice. Oh, where did you get the coin for that? <laughs> Daddy's credit card. <laughs> Doesn't look like Paige is under her boyfriend's bad influence. It seems like she's doing fine influencing herself. Thanks, baby. It looks amazing. But when it comes to parents and their kids, nobody wants to believe the worst. And it's a whole lot easier to blame someone else, like a guy with a rap sheet, rather than your precious daughter. The next day, Edward has a peace offering. Paige, let's talk. So talk. Let's go away on a vacation to your favorite place on the beach. Remember, you had such a great time. I think we should do it again. He wants to repair their relationship and has planned a trip to an exclusive resort in the Caribbean. OK, do you insist? Just you and me. So Edward 
Edward is trying to get his baby girl away from the big bad boyfriend by reverting to old times. He's hoping a holiday together will help them heal their rift. Seriously, that ship has sailed. It's over the horizon. Paige doesn't look ready to forgive and forget. Sorry, Dad, you're not very good at reading the signs. Or should I say, emojis. Paige has no plans to go away with her father and leave Trey behind. She steals Edward's credit card and books her boyfriend a first-class ticket. Paige, we're only going for a week. Oh, Daddy, you know I like to be prepared. Edward hopes a vacation will help him and his rebellious daughter Paige reconnect after the sudden death of her mother. He's also intent on getting Paige away from her bad boy boyfriend. I'm going out. But they've barely checked in when Paige decides to go solo. I thought we were going to spend some time together. <laughs> Daddy, don't rush me. We're meeting for lunch. Edward lets her go, but makes it clear he wants to spend some quality time with his daughter. Baby. Yo, this place is dope. You ready? Totally. Is there an emoji for uh-oh? If not, there ought to be. I can't be certain what the text message means exactly, but it's safe to say these two kids are up to something, don't you think? Paige has anger issues and her boyfriend has been arrested for a weapons charge. If I were Edward, I'd see Esther with one eye open. Edward has been waiting for Paige for over half an hour and she's a no-show. What the hell is he doing here? Well, I invited him courtesy of you, Daddy dearest. While Edward is angry that Paige stole his credit card to book Trey a flight and a hotel room, he's more furious that she purposely hijacked their much-needed father-daughter getaway. This trip was supposed to be about fixing our family. Well, he is going to be a part of our family, Daddy. Well, 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 our poor little rich girl is just full of surprises. My guess is that this spur-of-the-moment proposal at the ripe old age of 17 is Paige's way of getting back at her father for moving on so fast. And what better way than marrying a boy your father disapproves of? I hate him. I, I, I wish he died instead of her. My mother never gave me a hard time. This is all his fault. Well... I mean, we could just get married. I, I love it. <laughs> We're getting married whether you like it or not. Absolutely out of the question. <laughs> you can't stop us. If you disobey me, Missy, and marry this hustler, you're not going to get one more cent from me. <laughs> How about a hug, Pops? Yeah, right, buddy. Obviously, Edward's never read a parenting blog. Making threats to a teenager, especially when you're angry, is not generally a wise idea. And Paige isn't exactly good with limits. Losing her mom has made her even more volatile. I have a feeling that this ultimatum is gonna blow up in his face. How she'll retaliate is anybody's guess. The next morning, it looks like Edward hasn't managed to tear Paige and Trey apart. Please. It's not every day when you find a suitcase stuffed with a dead body instead of dirty socks. Island police need to track down Paige and her bad news boyfriend 
to figure out what happened to send Edward packing for good. Police arrive at the resort to investigate Edward's murder and immediately search the hotel room. They discover an unopened bottle of bubbly. It's heavy enough to do more damage than just cause a severe hangover. And with a print left behind, they hope it leads them to the killer. It was just him and his daughter that came down together. That's right. When police try to locate his daughter Paige and her boyfriend Trey, None of the employees know their whereabouts. The Bahamian police scour the island looking for the couple. With Edward dead, it's possible Paige and Trey could also be victims. Police eventually receive the tip the couple has been spotted at a seedy motel. Police, open up! Are you Paige and Trey? Well, before I answer any questions, what business do you have barging in here? What about our privacy? On your feet. As the last people to be seen with Edward, Paige and Trey are brought in for questioning. So we're trying to get to the bottom of what happened to your father, Edward. I see that you checked in together, shared a room together. When was the last time you saw him? Well, actually, it was um, right before we got engaged. <laughs> My congratulations. Thank you. When police question Paige and Trey about Edward's murder, they claim to have no idea what happened. They tell police they left the resort early on Friday to get married. But, uh, ran into a little trouble. Well, yeah, what kind of trouble? Well, I mean, walking down the street, and this guy comes up, he's asking us for money. A knife on us. Ah! Not my phone! Not my phone! <laughs> Knocked her right out of his hand. I mean, no one hurts my girl. <laughs> Rich tourists off the resort are prime pickings for local criminals, so Trey's story sounds believable. If you believe he's a quick thinking hero or just quick thinking, period. That's gonna be a stretch, especially once the police find out he has a record and his prints are in the system. Police run Trey's prints and discover they're a perfect match to the bloody fingerprint left on the champagne bottle. Even more damning is the surveillance footage from the hotel. When police put Paige in the hot seat, she plays it cool. Is that me? <laughs> the resolution could be better. It's the same suitcase. Why'd you do it? It was awful. I, I, I mean, we didn't mean for it to happen, but it, it all just happened so quickly. Paige tells police it was an accident. She says that after their argument, she placed an order with room service. Yes, uh, one bottle of your most expensive champagne, Cristal, if you have it. No, thanks. She says she was hoping her father would come around and toast their engagement. Over my dead body, are you going to marry her? <laughs> You're such a drama queen. You want drama? I'll show you drama. You're crazy, crazy creep. The next thing I know, he's lunging at me with a bottle of champagne. She tells police that her father was so angry that he completely lost control. Daddy, are you okay? Paige claims that Trey didn't intend to kill Edward. He was just protecting her. 
but when they realized he was dead, they panicked because of Trey's prior criminal history. They knew it wouldn't look good on him. Once they ditched the suitcase, they took off. And if it weren't for Trey, then <sighs> who knows what would have happened. <sighs> Can I have my phone back now? If I'm reading this right, and I'm no emoji expert, but I'd say Paige is confident she's come clean, and it's just a matter of time before she can start planning the social event of the season, her wedding. Sorry to burst your bubble, Paige, but when it comes to a murder investigation, the cops don't call it a day after a so-called confession. Police discover upon the death of her father, Paige becomes the sole beneficiary to her mother's multi-million dollar estate. So Giselle was the one with the money in the marriage. Getting daddy out of the way would mean a lot more money for Paige and nobody to enforce her curfew. And if past behavior is any indication, what Paige wants, Paige gets. When Trey marries her, he'd also reap the ill-begotten rewards, though he'd have to put up with all of her emojis. I mean, I mean emotions going into the marriage. Is Paige a grieving teenager caught up in a family drama, or is she a stone-cold killer who planned the ultimate payback for a big payout? Police need to find proof, or she and her fiance could walk. Police retrieve Paige and Trey's deleted cell phone correspondence going back a number of months. Okay, man emoji, gun, scary skull, money bag. These are starting to make sense to me. That's scary that it does. But you don't have to be a millennial to figure out that these messages paint a pretty disturbing picture. They prove that Paige and Trey planned on killing Edward for the money. We have an emoji for that. It's a premeditation emoji. When the police confront Trey with the text message evidence, he breaks. I mean, she's gonna give me this huge cut of the inheritance if I took out this hit. You got played. Turns out Paige's inheritance is actually only $5 million. Now that's not peanuts, but it still falls way short of her claim and it buys her a lot fewer hair bands, that's for sure. It looks like Miss Emoji was the mastermind of this plan, but she convinced Mr. Gangsta Light to do the actual deed. And for that, I guarantee he'll be doing a long stint in a foreign prison. Trey tells police what really happened that night. After the scene in the lobby, Edward and Paige had a talk. Paige, you know, you're just too young to get married. But Daddy, I've always been mature for my age. Okay, fine, so we'll have a long engagement. All the celebs do it. Yes, hi, I'll have a bottle of your most expensive champagne. Crystal, if you have it. No, thanks. Having put their bad blood behind them temporarily, Paige tells her father that the moment deserves a champagne toast. Paige's plan was simple. Trey and Paige are both charged and convicted of Edward's murder. They're both sentenced to 15 years in prison. During the trial, Paige shows no remorse for her father's murder, but true to form, she reveals all to the media via text message with a phone she sweet-talked from a fellow inmate. Whoa, talk about emojis running high here. Uh, allow me to translate. Paige claims her motive for killing her dad was revenge. 
Giselle's autopsy proved she died of a stroke, but in Paige's mind, her father killed her. And when he tried to end her relationship with Trey, in her mind, he became an evil monster. And for that, she was convinced he deserved to be punished. Kids might blame their parents for their unhappiness, but Paige crossed a line. She committed patricide, which isn't as uncommon as you may want to believe. So what do you think? Entitled rich kid who snapped after her mother's death or a stone cold sociopath? If you have any thoughts, text me. But no emojis, please.